All right, so Mark chapter 8. Let's go ahead and let's read several verses here. Mark chapter 8, and let's go down to verse number 34, okay? Mark chapter 8 and verse number 34 says this. It says, When he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father, with the holy angels. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much that we're all gathered here. Lord, I pray. Uh, Lord, thank you for um, people. Many here probably had to sacrifice, had to hurry home from work, and are uh, taking some time off. They'll be a little bit extra tired tomorrow. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would just use the scriptures tonight to meet some spiritual needs, to encourage them, to lift them up, uh, to stir them, uh, to go on to serve you and uh, to do right. And I pray that you would um, change us because of what we'll see in your word here tonight. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, um, it was a few years back. Actually, uh, it was actually here over at the school. I remember hearing, um, uh, it was Micah Strickler, if you know that name. Micah Strickler came up to me and he said, uh, we were probably in like second or third grade, okay? So this, uh, we weren't uh, very big kids, second, third, maybe fourth grade, something like that. And he said to me, did you hear that there is a club that's being started? Oh, you know, boys and clubs, you know, like, oh, I want to be a part of a club, you know, um, but, uh, uh, and the two people, the two guys were starting it, they weren't, uh, they were not students at the school, I don't, I don't know exactly uh, where they were from, or, uh, or you know, uh, they had some connections, I think, to some people in the church, uh, but I didn't really know who they were, they showed up a couple of times, but apparently he pointed out who they were, uh, he pointed them out to me, and he said, these are the two guys, they're going to be starting this new club, now listen, you know, here's, you know, me and Micah, we're like second, third grade, okay? And these, these guys who were starting this club, these were not little kids. These were like older kids, like almost adults. Like, they might have been sixth grade, you know? And, uh, well, we looked at them as, you know, being these like really older kid, older people. And, um, and so they were having a club. And so from what he told me, and, you know, of course, second, third graders, these are really good sources of information if you need to make sure something's repeated correctly sarcasm. Um, so, uh, so he said to me, he said, so there's three ways. If you want to get into this club, there's an initiation. Oh, okay. So what's the initiation? Well, the nice thing was you got to pick one of three ways to get into this club. Okay. Method number one was you could take a knife and carve a smiley face into your arm. That was option one. Now, if you didn't like that option, there was option number two. Option number two was you were to take your hand and stick it into a, like a, uh, like a, a fireplace fire and hold it there for five seconds. And if you didn't like that, one more option. If you didn't like those things, uh, then the last option was, uh, that you could, now the number I remember is 30. Uh, but maybe it wasn't 30, because 30 is awfully high. Um, he said the, uh, the final option was you could jump off a building that was 30 feet tall. Now, I've jumped from a 30-foot 30 uh, 30 uh, diving board one time. Let me tell you, it takes forever to get down to the water from 30 feet up in the air. So I don't know if it was 30 feet, 10 feet, whatever it was. You know, it could be whatever you want it to be, really. Uh, but these were the options to get into this new club. Well, needless to say, uh, if you can check both my arms and my hands and uh, my, my knees, I did not try any of them. Uh, we didn't really want to be a part of that. It seemed a little extreme to just be a part of a club. But you know what's interesting is... Sometimes people will pay a pretty high price to be a part of something that's not very valuable, like that club. Um, you know, uh, I remember watching a, it was sort of like a documentary, it was an interview of some former gang members that talked about, you know, sometimes boys grow up and uh, they still have some clubs, but instead of them being just, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, a, you know, get rid of girls kind of club, it's a club, it becomes something maybe more like a gang. And I remember these um, uh, former gang members, they gave this, um, uh, these testimonies, these um, uh, examples from their lives, and they and basically said what it was like being inside of a gang. They said, you know, you always knew at high school 
you knew who was in the gang because sometimes, you know, people were coming to school who were poor, and then all of a sudden one day they'd show up with $200 shoes. And that was how you knew they were now in a gang because all of a sudden now they had money. He said, you know, it looked really promising. You know, the, um, uh, the gang members would promise. They'd promise money. They'd promise immorality. They'd promise uh, cars. They'd promise drugs. They'd promise family. And uh, so it all sounded so appealing. So he said, we joined. But he said, after you joined, he said, now all of a sudden you're running from everyone. You're constantly looking over your shoulder. He said, you're watching, uh, you're, you're watching for other gang members. If other gang members show up from other gangs and they show up on your turf, you have to fight them. You don't have an option. You have to immediately start to fight them. And um, he said, you know, you're constantly looking over your shoulder, running from other gangs, running from the police. And he said, it was not, a, it was not an organization that was worth being a part of. Again, People will sometimes pay a pretty high price to be a part of something that really is not very valuable. Now, what you say, Matt? Why do you bring that up? Let me bring it around here in this in this sense. Um, I would th- I th- I would think. You know, I look out, I look at your faces. I don't know all of you, all of you. I don't know all of your lives. I don't know where you're at in life right now. But I know this: if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, God wants to use you. Say, brother Matt, you don't know my age. You're right. God still wants to use you. Your age was not, God did not adjust his scriptures based on your age. God has a plan for every single one of us. And God, God really wants to use you. But can I say this? If you're going to be used of God, if you want to see God do some neat things with you, can I put it this way? He has some high demands. But on the flip side of that, the encouraging part is, is that even though he has high demands, he has incredible, incredibly high rewards. And so he says, if you want to be used by me, if you want to see me use you in some special ways, he says, you need to be my disciple. Look, if you would, at verse number uh, 34. I like how it says here in verse 34, Mark says that when he, when Jesus had called the people unto him with his disciples also. I really like how, how Mark, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, splits and says there was the people and then there was the disciples. In other words, there were the ones who were committed to Christ, even though they weren't perfect, far from perfect, even though they weren't perfect, there were the disciples and then there was the crowd. You know, inside of that crowd, there were probably people who believed that Jesus was the Messiah. There may have even been some people who have put their trust on Jesus to be their Savior from their sins in that crowd. But Mark makes a distinction, and Jesus makes a distinction here, and says basically, you know, if you want to be different from the crowd, if you want to be different from the people that are, are around you, he says, you need to be my disciple. Folks, could you really say, I am a disciple of Jesus Christ? You know, you could look at the, you could look down the pew, you could look at the people who are next to you, but, but we don't want to compare ourselves to the people next to us and say, am I, am I a better disciple than them? Am I following hard after Jesus than, than the other, than someone else? Well, 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 what let's do? Let's go to the passage and let's see what, how Jesus describes a disciple and what, uh, what Christ terms are for you to be a disciple. Because I'll tell you this, friend, a disciple is someone who God can use. There's plenty of adults in Bible preaching churches all over the, all over the U.S. Plenty of adults that are part of the crowd. But I'll tell you, there are not many disciples. What is a disciple of Jesus Christ supposed to look like? Well, let's look at it. First of all, if you want to see God use you, if you want to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, number one, you need to read the conditions. You need to read the conditions. Uh, you ever, you ever notice that when, when you, um, uh, maybe when you download something, when you're going to purchase something, have you ever seen that box at the bottom that says, accept the terms and conditions? You know those boxes? The box that we just check mark and we never read. You know, you ever wonder if someday you're going to check mark something and it's going to come back and you'll find out that you just agree they can have, you know, like your whole house or something like that. Sometimes I wonder about those, about those uh, terms and conditions because oftentimes we just accept terms and conditions and we don't even bother to read them. You know what Jesus says? If you want to be a disciple of mine, he says you need to read the conditions in order to be a disciple that I can use. What does the Bible say? Well, Jesus says, first of all, that whosoever will come after me, he says, let him deny himself. 
So, condition number one, Jesus says, you have got to deny yourself. Now, maybe someone sits out there and says, oh, but, but Matt, Brother Matt, I cannot, I cannot deny who I am as a person. Okay, <laughs> That is not what this passage is talking about at all. Okay, What does the word deny mean? It's real simple. The word here, deny, Jesus says, deny yourself. The word deny is a simple Greek word that means, I'm, I'm, I'm serious about this, it just means to say no. It's not deep. It's just a simple word that means to say no. So in other words, Jesus says, if you want to be a disciple of mine, you have got to teach yourself to say no to certain things. You know, um, you know that really requires kind of a fundamental reorientation of the way we think. You know, if you were to go on a diet, maybe if you were to go on a diet that uh, you have to get rid of all gluten, or maybe you want to get rid of all sugars, or, or something like that. You know, um, if you're going to get rid of all sugars, you know, that requires, for lack of a better way to put it, a fundamental reorientation of the way you think. Because, you know, when someone comes into Sunday school and plops that box down on the table and says, oh, I got Krispy Kreme. Oh, dear, you know, and uh, now you're thinking, oh, no, you know, what's more important here? My, my goals, uh, you know, my goals for, um, you know, my diet or, uh, or uh, just allowing one of these things to pass over my mouth one more time. You know, when uh, uh, maybe you're going out to eat and someone says, hey, do you want to get desserts? You've got to already have it set to say, well, no, I've got to say no to these things if I am going to live this way. Maybe beforehand, it was nothing for you to have a donut in Sunday school. Maybe it was nothing for you to have dessert after uh, after you go out to eat. And so Jesus says, if you are going to be a disciple of mine, if you want to see me use use you, Jesus says, you have got to get used to saying no to what you want. Now, we're Americans, so we don't do that well. Because we've been taught, well, you know, you can be whoever you want to be. You can make yourself into whatever you can want to make yourself, and if you do, you get to enjoy it. And I get it. That's the beautiful, that's the beauty of the American dream, but we have allowed that to creep into our Christianity. Because, you know, some of you may, you've got to learn to say no to certain things. Maybe you've had to learn, you know, uh, you remember back two years ago, COVID, remember when maybe everything went live stream and you were at home by yourself? And, uh, and uh, you know, then all of a sudden when uh, churches started to open back up, maybe you had to learn to say no to your desire to sleep in just a little bit longer because that was really nice, you know? I remember the times where we were just coming in. Uh, i just come in to help with the live stream at like 10.50, you know, that's on a Sunday morning. I didn't have to be up early for Sunday school because that was canceled. And, uh, you know, just coming in at 10.55, I'd lead the songs and listen to Pastor preach. And, you know, after that, sometimes it gets to a point where we got to, you got to learn to say, oh my goodness, it would be nice to like just uh, show up, you know, when I want to uh, for church, but, uh, or just stay home and do live stream. But you, those are times we had to learn to say no to what we want. You know, uh, maybe you've got, uh, maybe you've got things on your phone. Maybe you've got just different forms of, of not sinful entertainment on your phone. And those are the things that you poured some time into, which is not wrong, but just maybe you're pouring time into it at the expense of your devotions. You want to be used by God, folks. If we're going to be used by God, some of the phone stuff has got to go. And it cannot take the place of our Bibles. It cannot take the place of our Bibles. You know, maybe it's uh, maybe it comes down to um, uh, maybe it's coming down to you know missions conference and and uh, your missions conference is coming up and and so you think well and so maybe you're th- maybe you've um, got a decision you want to make on uh, maybe there's like a. Um, an item you want to buy yourself, but you realize, oh my goodness, no, God wants me to be giving at the missions conference. And so, and so sometimes we got to learn to say no to certain things that we want so that we can, we can follow hard after Jesus Christ. Jesus says, if you're going to be my disciple, you're going to have to learn to say no to certain things. What else? Well, he says in verse number 34, that not only will you have to deny yourself, he says, then you will have to take up your cross. Take up your cross. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, um, you know, sometimes people take this phrase, take up your cross, and sometimes we get a little confused as to exactly what it means. What did Jesus mean by this? Let me start by telling you two things uh, that um, take up your cross, the phrase there, bearing your cross. Let me tell you two things that it's not. Uh, One thing it's not is it's not talking about physical punishment. Um, some people think that uh, uh, that the way they can bear, uh, they can bear their cross, Jesus says, 
take up your cross, that the way that they can do that is they will actually, there are people who will, uh, you know, they might crawl on their knees to church. Uh, they might uh, take a whip and whip themselves. Uh, they may actually, uh, you know, if you go to the Philippines, these things happen. And uh, there's uh, there's actually even over Easter, there are some people who will na- have themselves nailed to crosses to celebrate Easter because they believe that that is them taking up their cross to follow Jesus. Okay, that is not what Jesus is referring to here. Can I tell you something else that it's not referring to here? When Jesus says, you need to take up your cross, you need to bear your cross, you know something else Jesus is not talking about? He's not talking about having a disease or a sickness. What what do you mean, Matt? Like this. You know, sometimes uh, we're sitting, maybe you have some kind of a, a disease, maybe you have some kind of a handicap. You say, well, you know, Matt, this is just my cross to bear. Folks, just so that you know, taking up your cross and bearing your cross is a choice. Pretty sure none of us picked our, you know, a handicap or picked a disease for ourselves. Those are the things that God has just allowed to happen to us. But bearing your cross, it is a choice that either you are going to do it or you're not going to do it. It's not something that just kind of gets plopped on your plate. What does Jesus mean when he says that you need to bear or take up your cross? Well, here's there's a couple aspects to it, but here's the one that I think that has helped me the most. Uh, one of the aspects of this is the idea that uh, that you take um, uh, that when someone was going to be executed, when someone was going to be crucified by the Romans, of course they were commanded to carry their own cross out of town. And so that as they would, as this criminal would walk down the streets, the people would see this criminal, probably someone they knew, and see him walking down the streets underneath this cross. And you know what it was a picture of? The Romans had the criminals carry their own crosses to their place of execution because what it was, was it was now a picture for the whole community, a picture of submission. Here's this criminal who has run rampant and done whatever he wanted to do, and now he has been forced into submission to the Roman government, and the cross that was on his back as he carried it outside the city was the symbol that he was now in submission to the Roman government. You know what? uh, When Jesus says, take up your cross, you want to be a disciple of mine, you want to be used by me, Jesus says, you've got to be willing to submit to me in everything, no matter how small it is. Usually we don't mind submitting certain things. We don't mind surrendering certain things to God, but we keep a little box set aside and say, God, this is my box, and I've got certain things in it. God, you can have this whole pile of stuff over here. Just don't mess with my box. Folks, if you want God to use you, God has to have the box too. God has to have everything in it. Or, well, you just can stay a part of the crowd. God to use you. You can uh, deny yourself and then bear your cross, full submission to whatever God wants from your life. Then he says, finally, in verse 34, he says, not only deny yourself and take up your cross, but then he says, you need to follow me. And the uh, the tense, the present tense that the, the, the Greek is there on that verb, follow me, it has the idea of keep on following me. Day after day after day, you've got to be following after me. And this phrase, this phrase, follow me, it has the idea, uh, if there's a word that I could use that help us kind of, uh, well, what does it mean to follow Jesus? How, how do I walk in the steps of Jesus? How do I pursue after Jesus? The, as I was reading, this phrase, follow me, it has the idea, the concept of loyalty to it. In other words, Jesus is saying that your loyalty above everything else has to be to me. Oh, oh, we say, well, sure, yes. God's number one. Yeah, he often is until you read Luke 14. 14, 26, which says, Jesus said, if any man come to me, same kind of concept of following after me, he says, if any man come to me and Hate not his father, his mother, his wife, his children, his brothers, his sisters, yea, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Whoa, no, is, is Jesus, let's ask this first, is Jesus teaching us to hate other people? No, absolutely not, because that would be a violation of the law. What is Jesus saying here? One of the things I think what Jesus is trying to communicate here is the idea that if you are going to be loyal to Jesus, if you're going to be loyal to him in the way that a disciple ought to, we put it this way, people are going to 
you could even think that you hate your family. Like this. You know, um, you know, the United States isn't the only country on, on the planet. You know that, right? There's other countries out there. You know, there are in Muslim countries over in the Middle East, uh, in very, um, uh, very uh, intense Catholic areas of, of the country of Mexico. There are families who, um, you know, sometimes there are young people who hear about Jesus Christ and they, they accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. And when they try to tell their families about it, their families want nothing to do with them. And in fact, they'll sometimes disown them. They'll kick them out of the house and they pretend like they don't even exist. And oftentimes, these families will then go to other families and other friends and they'll tell them all about how, oh, my son, he doesn't love us anymore. He hates his family. He's going up to that Jesus. He hates us. And uh, these other friends and family are saying, wow, what a terrible son you have. That's just awful. Good thing you disown him. He must hate you a whole lot. Does the son hate his family? No, 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 of course not. But what the world has done is it has mistaken the loyalty to Jesus Christ for hatred. When the, the son, you know, these, these people, they don't hate their family. They just love Jesus first. Does he get all of your loyalty? Does he come before family? Friends, can I tell you, can I tell you a worldly phrase that has gotten, it has got, it is all over the place. It's definitely, I've heard in the workplace and it's, um, it's gotten into the church. It's gotten into Christians and it really is a worldly philosophy and it really needs to go from the church. Okay. Can I tell you this worldly philosophy? Ready for it? Family is everything. Family is everything. Friend, if you know Jesus Christ is your savior, can I tell you something? Family is not everything. God is everything. And if you put and if you put your family before God, watch out, it won't be long before you lose your family too. Family is not everything. God is. And if we'll put God first, it is amazing what God will sometimes do, the miracles he'll work in our families. Jesus says, You want to be my disciple? You want to see me use, you want to see me use you? He says, You've got to be loyal to me, even if your family doesn't understand. I remember my dad would tell about uh, about when he got saved and, you know, just how his mom just didn't understand it. She just thought, oh, you'll get over it. Well, he's, you know, I don't know, how old is he? Is he 64, 65? He ain't over it yet, okay? So he's still he's still doing okay. You know, he's, you know, and, and people think that, and people think that, well, you must hate your family. Well, no, if you're going to see Jesus use you, he gets first priority in everything, even in the realm of our families. Sometimes, oh, sometimes we, we want, we say, well, I want Jesus to use me, but we prioritize and we idolize our, our families and family activities and family events over things that will please God. And uh, folks, that, that is so really anti-discipleship for Jesus says, you've got to follow after me. Those are his conditions. Now, I want you to see this. I want you to see here in the rest of the passage, I want you to see uh, the risks of, maybe you're here and you're saying, you know what, you know what, Matt, I really don't need another preacher coming to me and telling me, sho- shoving down my throat that I need to do more for Jesus Christ. I really don't need any more of that. Hey, let me show you what Jesus says are the risks if you're going to say that. Look at what he says. Verse number 35, Jesus says that whosoever will save his life shall lose it. Whosoever will save his life shall lose it. That word save is a, it's an interesting word. It's a word that means to preserve, to try to, almost like the idea of try to wrap it up and protect it from every, from anything ever hurting it. He says anyone who tries to preserve their life, and the idea is, um, it's not really talking about salvation here. We're talking about discipleship here. So it's not really talking about like you getting saved, you asking Jesus to be your savior. It's the idea God says that if you try to preserve your life, like you find that, that perfect American dream, that perfect American life where you've got a decent job, where you've got a wife and, and this many kids, and you've got your, you, you've got your house, and you've got your 401k building up, and you've got your retirement, and you've got everything laid out just the way you want it. Oftentimes when we will say, well, I have got to preserve that special thing of life. Let me tell you, security is a wonderful thing to know uh, that your investments are doing okay, to know that your retirement is there, to know that you have 
your wife, your children, that you are set for the future. But you know what Jesus is saying here is that if all your focus is on is just trying to preserve that life the way you want it, just in the way you want it, and you try to preserve that up, and you work at doing that, Jesus says you are going to end up losing it. Whoa. He says you will end up losing it. You know, we oftentimes spend so much time, so much effort, so much energy, and we just give ourselves to to work, to sports, to friends, to dating, to hobbies, until, and and not that any of those things are bad, but we, we give ourselves to these things until there's no time for church, for witnessing, for visitation, for Bible study, for personal devotions, for family devotions. See, the problem is there's nothing wrong with uh, with uh, with work, sports, friends, dating, and hobbies. The problem is that we get those things and we just are like, this is the perfect American life. And we try to, as Jesus said, save it. We try to preserve it and have it just the way it's supposed to look like. Folks, if this life was all we were getting, that would make total sense. But you do know, as Philippians says, your citizenship is not here on this earth. The Bible says our citizenship is in heaven. It is there. And so why do we live so enthusiastically for what is on earth when we, when, when what we should really be doing is living for the things that are above? Verse number 36. He says, verse number 36, what shall it profit? You've probably seen this verse before. What shall it profit a man? There's a good money word, profit. What shall it profit a man if he gained the whole world and lose his own soul? Or he says, what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? In other words, what Jesus is saying here, again, now, I think this is a decent verse to show uh, unsaved lost people, to show them the value of, of getting saved. But again, this passage, this verse is in the context of discipleship. And I wonder if Jesus is not saying, if he's saying, you know, what, what good is it? What kind of profit is it if you got to accumulate the whole world and yet you lost the things that will last in eternity? What's going to last in eternity? Souls of men. You know, again, we have plenty of time for hobbies. We have plenty, we often make plenty of time for the things that we enjoy. And then all of a sudden, something happens when, uh, I don't know, when like vacation Bible school time rolls around. And all of a sudden, Pastor, I am too busy. Pastor, I am just so sorry. I just don't know that I have, I'm just not really able to do anything anymore. I just, uh, when usually sometimes that is an excuse that set, basically an excuse for, I don't want to do it anymore. Say, Matt, you don't know anything about me. You're right. And oftentimes it is an excuse that we, for, basically we want to say, I really just don't want to get involved. Folks, I hope we didn't forget, like for example, Vacation Bible School. I hope we, we haven't forgotten that the whole point of Vacation Bible School is not to give children a good time during the summer when they're out of school. The whole point of Vacation Bible School is to see some children get saved and so that their eternity is changed from hell to heaven and so that maybe we can reach some adults too. You know, that's something worthwhile getting involved in. But we oftentimes we say, well, I'm too busy. And we say, well, I just don't know if I, I'm able to do everything. Listen, listen, I understand, so especially sometimes health will limit what we can do. But I'll tell you what, everybody can get on board in some way. Listen, you might not be able to be the one uh, that's uh, that's up in front, you know, making the, I don't know, making balloon animals and, and going around and running offering buckets and all that. That may not be you anymore. But uh, but there's always somewhere you can get involved in the battle and be a part. You know, I remember one person saying saying this. He said, the, the, the church is not a cruise ship where a few people take care of the pleasure of everyone else. The church is a battleship where we need all hands on deck for the sake of lost souls. If we're not all, if we're not going to be on board, if we're not going to be on board with God's plan, who's going to be? I remember a lady in uh, the state of Maryland. My goodness, this lady, you want to talk about health problems? This lady was, um, she was uh, paralyzed on her leg. She was in a wheelchair and she could not get around. Now listen, that church did visitation. They would go out to different, you know, go out to houses, knock on some doors and invite some people. Well, this lady, she is, uh, you know, what can she do? You know what oftentimes American Christians say? Well, I, you know, this is just how it is. I guess I can't get out to visitation. Oh, but this lady said, no, 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 not me. And so she's, you know what she would do? Every Saturday, she would come to the church, 
she would come at, she would come to the church in her wheelchair and there was a couple a young couple in the church they would show up at the exact same time they would drop their three kids off she would babysit them while the two couples went while the two, while the couple went out and told people about Jesus can I tell you something that lady's on the team Lady in the wheelchair is on the team and being a part of seeing people get saved. Folks, what is it going to profit if we're able to say, well, I'm j- if I do this, I'm going to be able to squeeze out just a little more overtime so I can squeeze out just a little more enjoyment, so I can squeeze out just a little more hobbies and I'll have just a little bit more in our, in our retirement. Folks, folks, what are we living for? What are we living for? Listen, no one is saying that God is not against you have being comfortable. God is not against you having money. God is not against any of those things. But listen, they cannot take over your whole purpose of life. Have we forgotten that God's purpose for us is not for, is not just to enjoy comfort before we're taken up to heaven, but that we are here uh, we are here to be involved in the great commission. That we're here for the souls of men. Where 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 are you involved on the battleship? Where are you involved in fighting for the souls of men? Because what sh- what can a man give in exchange for his soul? What is more valuable than a person's soul? Verse number 38. Oh, look at this risk. He says, one thing you've risked, you know, forfeiting, you know, people's souls and losing them for eternity. But he also says in verse number 38, Wherefore, uh, or whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Listen, I don't know all of what Jesus means by that, but I know this, that when Jesus comes, I wouldn't want him to be ashamed of me. And you know what would make him ashamed of you and of me? We're not a disciple. If we said, well, you know, Jesus, I, I, I know, like, unsaved people going to hell was pretty important, but, you know, my boat. I really wanted to get on my boat. So God's not against you having a boat. If God's blessed you with one, good for you. I don't know. I have an RV, and I hear RVs are like boats. And they fall apart a lot, so I don't know. But, uh, but you know, uh, but what God is trying to say is that, listen, even you can have your things. If God's blessed you with stuff, enjoy your stuff. Nothing wrong there, but it better not keep you from the ultimate purpose of, of that we have as a church, which is to be involved in seeing the souls of men one, one to the Lord. Look at verse 35 again. We'll kind of wrap it up right here. It says, whosoever shall save his life, shall try to preserve it, will lose it. But notice what Jesus also says. Whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, he says the same shall preserve it, shall save it. He says, you want to have purpose in life? He says, get involved. Get involved in being a disciple. Get involved in serving me with everything that you've got. He said, do it for my sake. Do it for, he says, for the gospel's sake, for the sake of lost souls. And he says, get in it now because, because, because all these other things that will not last into eternity, souls will last in eternity. And he says, you want to, um, preserve your life? It's not saying that you'll lose your salvation. If you don't, uh, uh, if you don't become a, dis- a good disciple of Jesus Christ, but what he's saying is, you want to have some purpose in this life. He says, get involved in what will last past this life. Are you? Are you? Do the neighbors know that you're a Christian? Do the people at work know where they can come to when they have a Bible question? Do the unsaved know? Who will pray for them when life hurts? Do the lost know where to come? The lost people in your life, do they know where to come? They have questions about eternity. You involved in your church, whether, you know, there's uh, here at Bible Conference, there's multiple churches represented by you all sitting out here tonight. You involved in the battleship of your church? For the sake of lost souls? I hope you can say you are, because I'll tell you this. You want to have a life that's full of purpose, Jesus says, be a disciple. Don't just be part of the crowd. There's plenty of people in the crowd. Jesus says, be a disciple and watch how I can use you. It'll cost you. Oh, but but Jesus says, there are rewards. Oh, it'll be worth it. It will be worth it. It will be a disciple and not just another Christian in the crowd. Let's be a disciple 
Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for this passage. Thank you. I know I need blunt. And so, Jesus, thank you for giving us a blunt description of what being a disciple of Jesus Christ really looks like. I pray, dear Lord, that you would you would help us to prioritize. Help us to prioritize. Help us to beware of idols that will keep us from what we ought to do. Let me just ask this. With your heads bowed and eyes closed, no one's looking around, heads bowed, eyes closed, just to make it simple, how many of you here would say, Matt, God spoke to my heart tonight. I'm not going to get into specifics here, uh, but you would just say, Matt, God spoke to my heart tonight. There is an area where I need to be more like a disciple of Jesus Christ, and God pointed that out to me tonight. How many of you would raise your hand and say, God's pointed an area in my life out to me tonight where I need to be a better disciple of Jesus Christ? How many of you would raise your hand? Yes, good, yes, yes, yes. Good, yes, yes, you can put it down. Yes, sir, yes, ma'am, you can put it down. Good, yes, wonderful. Praise the Lord. Okay, so if God's shown you something, then what we need to do is we just need to go straight to prayer. God's shown you something that needs to change so that you become what God desires of us, then let's go to prayer. Listen, whatever it is, commit it all to God. You might even be in a situation where you say, oh my goodness, I don't know how this is going to work out. Maybe your time schedule, maybe money is tight. I don't know what it may be, but you say, I don't see how this is going to work. Well, nothing else, will you take this time and commit to the Lord and say, God, something's got to change. I Something's got to be different. I got to get on board with your plan because there's too many people going to hell. There's too many people lost. Lord, change things so that I can be involved. Listen, you talk with the Lord. Um, Sarah, if you'll just play the song of your choice, whatever you have there uh, as kind of an invitation song. And as she plays, uh, would you just would you just talk with the Lord? If you want to come on down here to the front and have a seat on the front pew, if you want to bow at the front, that is totally fine if you want to do that. If you want to sit down... <laughs> You want to sit down next to Pastor Fox and just say, would you pray with me? Because this is going to be hard going forward. You could just come on down to the front pew and sit down next to Pastor Fox, and he'll just pray with you. But as she plays, would you just talk with the Lord right here, right now?